Good morning, church. My name's Hope, if we haven't met before, and I'm going to be doing our Bible reading for us today. So we're reading together from Colossians 3, verses 1 to 14, um, and I'll give you a second to grab your Bible, grab your Bible apps um, and various devices to find that. So that was Colossians 3, verses 1 to 14. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Raised with Christ. Hey. <laughs> Christ obviously sorts mics out. Since then, the mic has been raised with Christ. Wonderful. Shall I say all of that again for the people online? I trust that you heard something. And if not, I'll give it to you one-on-one -on -one at the end. Um, we're in Colossians 3, walking through it verse by verse uh, to draw out of it all that God has got for us today. So verse 1, since then, you have been raised with Christ. This whole passage, everything I'm about to say, is built on the fact that we have been raised with Christ. It's the foundation that everything else will come to rest on. And as we celebrated a couple of weeks ago at Easter, we, having died with Christ, our old nature's gone into the grave, like baptism so helpfully reminds us. We are now raised with him. He died and then came back to life, and our old nature died, and our new nature came to life. This whole talk, this whole passage, is predicated and built upon the fact that we are now raised with Jesus. You are now raised with Jesus. Your old nature is gone, and your new nature is coming to be. We're dead to ourselves and our old natures, the cross has put to death all the things that come with that old way of living, and it's liberated us through the tomb to live this new way of life. We are now new natures, fully alive in Jesus. And that's the foundation for everything to come. Verse 2 then, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Since Christ has given you this new life, set your minds on things above. Wasn't it interesting to be lifted to the ceiling even as we started in worship? Lift your eyes to things above. What's going on in heaven right now? Because if that's the reality that we're longing to see on earth, that's what we need to see so that we can then bring it about here on earth. How can we bring about something that we don't know? Set your minds on things above where Christ is seated next to Father God, praying on your behalf urging this kingdom on so that all of us can live more and more in its fullness. Fix our eyes, our attention on him and the things of the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Verse 3 then, our old life has, has died, as I've said. We are in Christ and he is our life. We live in his glory. And if that's all true, jump into verse 5. There are some things that need to be put to death. Because it's not, no use just saying, well, put to death your old nature, but then all these other things just keep cropping up. We have to put these things to death. And really helpfully, the writer goes on to list them for us. If your old nature is dead, then sexual immorality needs to be gone. God cares about that. Impurity needs to be done away with. Lust, 
evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. So many things now need to go because they're part of the old way of living. God cares about greed and anger and rage and malice and slander and filthy language and lying. All those things are like attached onto the old way of life that should now be dead. And where they're evident in us, that's because there's a tussle going on. There is the old nature and the new nature, and they're at war with each other in us. Paul, in other places, talks about it as the flesh and the spirit. And both are at work. Both are tussling it out in you right now. Ultimately, the new nature wins. But the full victory hasn't yet arrived. And so put these things to death here and now. Free of all those things which are part of your old dead self. Verse 10. Now put on your new nature. Risen with Christ and full of his glory. Your new self, your new nature is being renewed in the knowledge of God who created you. As you put on your new self, it's like putting on that clothing that you were always meant to wear. Because it's in perfect relationship with God. And the more you wear it, the more you come to know God. The more you uh, become comfortable in it, the more you realize this is how life was supposed to be. That old nature is a, is a wrong na- nature. It's perverse. It's not right. And what I've put on now, this makes sense. This is life that is truly life. Put on your new self and let it be renewed in the knowledge of God, its creator. The old self and the traits that came with it dragged you away from God. They put enmity between you. They put distance between you and God, and they pulled you continually away from him because all those things are not who God is. And the more we indulge in them and give ourselves over to them, the less we can see God and the less we can experience him fully and have intimacy in relationship with him. Your new self, quite the opposite, renews you and pulls you towards God. It's a life that is truly life in his presence. Here in this way of living, jump into verse 11, there is no dividing line between people. This feels like a little bit of a gear change, doesn't it? I mean, talked about traits and old natures and new natures. It then goes on to talk about Gentile and Jew and slave and free. And it feels like, hang on a minute, that feels like a different talk. But think about it. If this is the way that we're supposed to live, if the old nature is gone and the new nature has come, and we're all one in Christ Jesus... Dividing lines of hostility between people have to be erased. And barriers of hostility have to be brought down because we're all one in Christ. It's a really important gear change, a telling one. It's not to say that those things don't exist. Don't hear it that you are now neither male or female. There isn't that in the kingdom. It's just to say these things don't define you anymore. These things might exist, yeah, they're part of who you are, your nature, your character, your background, who you are as a person, but those things don't define you anymore to the point where you could say, well, I'm not going to associate with them because of that, and I'm not going to go over there because of that. These things might be true of you still, but they don't define you, and neither should they define anybody else in God's kingdom. You are not your ethnicity. You're not your gender. You're not your background. You're not your occupation primarily anymore. If you're in Christ, you belong to him. You're not the worst thing you've ever done. And neither are you the best thing you've ever done. In Christ, you are his. And in Jesus, the most important thing about you is that you are his beloved. And as you then realize, well, that's also true of that person over there, because they know Jesus as well. All these dividing lines, these barriers of hostility, crumble away in God's presence and we're able to relate with people as he would want. And looking out on the world with these new clothes on, this new way of living, the dividing lines are rubbed out, the walls of hostility come down. And so having been raised with Christ and having put off the old nature and all those traits that come with it, what next? Well, verse 12 gives us everything that we want to be clothed with in Jesus. We want to be holy. We know we're dearly loved. Clothe ourselves then with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, with patience. Bear with one another. Forgive one another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you and over it all and encompassing it all and binding it all together, put on love. That's the thing that's going to make all this make sense. Pursuing each of them on their own will get you so far, but pursuing love will mean you get all of this thrown in for free. Be clothed with Christ. Put these things on. 
and let love hold it all together, for that's God's will for you in Christ Jesus. What a passage. So much in here. I want to pull three things out, really, and then we're going to see what God might want to do among us. So you want a kingdom vision for your relationships. Well, this passage says, first of all, fill your mind with the kingdom of heaven. I don't know if you've ever been so into a maybe a game on your phone or a book or a series. You've been so saturated by it that even when you're not doing it, even when you're sleeping, your mind goes there. You know there's like really addictive phone games that you start to, start to see when you wake up and everything starts to look like Tetris or whatever it is. I, lo- I would love it if it were more true of us that we're so saturated by the kingdom of heaven that that's the thing that we wake up dreaming about. That's the reality that's so much more true of us than anything else. So the way we can fill ourselves with books and series And the latest thing on Netflix, wouldn't it be amazing if more true of us than anything else was the kingdom of heaven that we're so surrounded by that we wake up thinking about it? Craig Grishel, the American pastor, church leader, says that your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. The strongest thoughts that you have set the course of the rest of your life because what's in your mind starts to work itself out through your behavior. Fill your mind then with the things of the kingdom of heaven and then everything will start to move in the direction of the kingdom of heaven. And so with that in mind and being really honest with yourself, not with me here and now, when was the last time you stopped and thought about the kingdom of heaven? The last time you actually just stopped and, as it were, looked at the clouds. What was going on in heaven right now? What would the kingdom look like overlaid on this situation? What's Jesus doing right now? What's he praying for, I wonder? When was the last time you let that just fill your mind and let everything else fade away? Thinking about the kingdom of God, thinking about his manifest presence, thinking about what's going on between the Father and the Son right now in the throne room of heaven. What's the Holy Spirit up to? When was the last time you let that occupy your mind to such a point that it started to dictate who you were, what you did, If we can't see it, then we can't create it. If we can't know what we're moving towards, then how can we hope to see it come on earth as in heaven? If we don't know what heaven looks like, we've got no plan to follow here on earth. Fill your mind with the kingdom of heaven. In the midst of everything else going on, all the competing demands that are going on to draw your attention to them, I would argue there's probably no better use of your time than to fill it with the kingdom of heaven. If you want a few suggestions for Bible passages to go to, um, you might want to try Exodus 24. Spend 10 minutes there. You'll love it. Maybe you want to go to Ezekiel chapter 1 or maybe the second half of Revelation 1. These are passages that are all about the kingdom, all about heaven, all about future glory. And if you spend any time there, you'll start to think, crumbs, that's what the kingdom's about. Obviously, read Jesus, read the Sermon on the Mount, read the parables about the kingdom of heaven. It's a little bit like this and it's a little bit like this. But the kingdom life is life in all fullness. Knowing that life then becomes the way that we can move towards that. Kingdom vision comes from thinking about and being saturated in the kingdom of heaven. I don't know if you notice, but in verse 1 of this passage, it says, set your hearts on these things. And in verse 2, it says, set your minds on these things. It's almost covering those two kind of central tracks of who it is. Set your mind, your intellect, your thoughts, your rationality. Set that on heaven and then set your heart on heaven as well. Your affections, your wills, your desires, your emotions. Set everything you've got on heaven, basically. All of it, heart, mind. All of it go to heaven. And then, once you receive that perspective, pull that back down to earth with you. So the earth continues to look more and more like the kingdom of heaven. This is the kingdom that we're praying will come to earth, will bless our lives, and will transform our communities. There's an old phrase that I really hate, and I'm not even going to give it the airtime to say it, but any of you who know what it is will know it by what I'm now going to tell you. Be so heavenly minded that you are a force for huge earthly good. There are some people who think that being, it's like you're away with the fairies if you're thinking about heaven. And I've got to say, I think that's absolute nonsense. How can you bring heaven to earth if you don't know what heaven looks like? How can you hope to see God's kingdom established in your life and through your relationships if you don't know what those relationships would look like? Be so heavenly minded. What would heaven look like right here, right now? What does that person need of the kingdom? What's God doing? What's the Father saying to the Son? God, what are you doing today? Show me. Delve into these passages. Be so heavenly minded. 
that you then become a force for amazing earthly good. Second thing, let Jesus give your wardrobe a makeover. Have you ever been in a relationship, uh, maybe a friendship with a housemate, maybe it's a husband-wife kind of relationship, where you notice that over time your wardrobe started to change? Best case scenario, I guess, is that they love your clothes so much that they've borrowed them uh, and they maybe never come back. Worst case scenario, and I'm not going to tell you which was the case for me, is that the charity shop was benefited by your old wardrobe, shall we say. As certain people sifted through it and thought, I really don't like that, and off it makes its way out of your life. Wardrobes change, don't they? And Jesus can make over your wardrobe. The writer here says, put off, take off these old clothes over here and put on these new things instead. I'm quite a big rugby fan. And um, once with my dad, oh, you're going to like this story. Um, Come on, Wales, Gareth said, for anyone who couldn't hear it. My dad's Welsh. And so quite often for family trips, we'll go and watch a game. My brother used to live in Cardiff. So sometimes we'd go down there and watch a game. And It's the kind of thing where you just watch whoever's playing. It's not really about a certain team. So this week, Wales were playing Argentina, and we managed to get tickets. And Dad's Welsh, obviously expecting him to go all out in his red regalia. I'm English, and like Wales uh, for a holiday, but don't really support them in terms of sport. But a few weeks earlier, I'd managed to find an Argentina football shirt for £3.50 in a charity shop. (laughs) So I was like, well, I'll go wearing this. I'll go with the Argentinians. I don't really care who wins in this sense. So turned up to the hotel on the morning where we were getting changed, ready to go off to the stadium in an Argentina strip. You should have seen my dad's face. (laughs) You're not coming with me. If you think you're going to go in an Argentina strip and sit amongst me and my Welsh friends, you've got another thing coming. And he had, in fact, brought Wales shirts for everyone. He got one for him, and he got a T-shirt and another one, an old one, whatever it was. And so I went with an Argentina shirt underneath and a Wales shirt over the top to watch this game because that's what Dad wanted. And that came back to me yesterday as I was re-reading over these notes because I think the temptation is to think, well, I can keep the old nature on underneath and just put the new nature on over the top. But the thing is, that's going to mean that the old nature is going to get out at some point. What the writer is saying here is put it off completely. Take it off. Get rid of it. Get it out of your life. The old nature and everything that comes with it. Take up the new thing. Don't wear two natures. Don't have two sets of clothes on. Pick. Put off the old nature. Pick up the new nature. It will be for your good. And when I say wardrobe makeover, what do I really mean by that? What I mean is with God and through the empowering of the Holy Spirit to do four main things identify what's of the old nature in you. Ask the Holy Spirit to put his finger on what it is that's part of the old nature that's still at work in your life. Put your finger on it. Name it. Define it. Don't be vague about this, because then you can't really put off something that you can't define. So identify it first up. Confess it. Say sorry to God that 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 thing is still a part of you, and give thanks for Jesus that he's taken the penalty away from you in that respect. Confess it before him. Third thing is to unpick it. Maybe this is the thing to do with other trusted friends, is to think, well, what on earth has caused that bit of the old nature to keep having a root in my heart? Because most of these things don't come from nowhere. If you've got a root of greed, maybe there's an unpicking to do around the area of provision, for example. Thinking, well, I've got to kind of look after myself because God can't. Well, that's maybe the unpicking to do. If we just pick at the, the, the fruit, if you like, we just pick at what's above the surface, yes, we can confess that, and it is gone in Christ. But the root is still going to be there, and it is probably going to reemerge at some other point with trusted friends and all done with the Holy Spirit. Ask him, where did this come from? What caused this? And unpick with him the root causes that brought about that thing in your life. And then finally, replace it. Because if you create a vacuum, you get rid of something, but nothing's there in its place. The temptation is for that thing or something similar to just re-emerge. And the interesting thing with this passage, as you all have seen, is that it's put off the old self, here's what that is. Put on the new self, here's what that is. So if you're getting rid of an element of your old nature, think, well, what's the kingdom alternative to this? What's the thing that would work in the opposite direction? And then replace that with what's going on in you. So take up patience if you've been really impatient and getting frustrated with people. Think, how can I actively pursue that? Don't just hope it's going to come about. But having unpicked and confessed, 
the old nature thing. What's the kingdom alternative and how can I pursue that? Identify it, confess it, unpick it and replace it. For the direction of travel for the Christian life is towards compassion and humility and kindness and love. I just want to say one word about this. Following Jesus is more than being good and kind. But it's certainly not less than that. Following Jesus is more than being good and kind, but it's certainly not less than that. Many people are good and kind who don't know Jesus. That's just the way that they operate in the world. We're not saved by our good works. We're not saved by our kindness. We're saved by God's gracious gift. At the same time, and let's be really honest, there are too many Christians who aren't good and kind who received a new nature and yet it hasn't quite worked itself out in that area of their life. We're saved by God's gracious gift. And once received, that should work itself out in goodness and kindness and compassion and all the other things listed here. I'd love for the church to have a reputation for outrageous kindness, for over-the-top generosity, for the place you want to go when you're down on your luck, where mercy is just overflowing and it melts cold hearts. That's the kind of church that I think Jesus sees, that Jesus urges us towards. And it is goodness and it is kindness. And yes, it's so much more than that, but it can't be devoid of that. Jesus' vision for a church, for relationships, isn't cold and calculated. It's abundant generosity. It's kindness, mercy, love coming over a multitude of sins and so many more things. And the thing, one of the things I love about Jesus was that he was good and kind. He was so good and kind that he was able to tell people their sin and they went away happy. <laughs> come, and tell, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. I'm not leaving that scenario happy because he told me everything I've ever done and I'm not proud of a lot of it. But Jesus was able to tell you the direct, honest thing in a way that was so full of love that people went away going, crumbs, he can take it away. He doesn't just identify it to make me feel bad. He identifies it so it can be done away with. That's the kind of kingdom we're seeking here and now. So what's the kindest thing anyone's ever done for you? And is there a way that you could replicate it, even outdo it, for someone this week? The kingdom isn't just kindness, but it's definitely kindness plus, right? What's the kindest thing anyone's ever done for you, and how could you replicate it, outdo it this week? Final thing to say, point three then, is relate in your new clothes. The strength of an organization or a group is the strength of its relationships. You can have great strategy and resource and plans and vision, and if you've got bad relationships, all of those things will fall away. The best teams aren't necessarily the teams with the best players. I can make lots of football analogies right now, and I'll save you from them. The best teams are the teams that work together the best, even if individually they're not the best players. The best bands are those that work together. The best work departments are those where the relationships are strongest, even if they don't have the best individual performers, whatever it is. Kingdom vision is outworked through relationships. That's all we've got accounts of Jesus doing, is meeting people, interacting with them, changing their lives, and then moving on to the next person. Relationships are the channels through which the kingdom flows. First, the relationship with you and Jesus, then the relationship with you and yourself, your self-identity, your self-esteem, then the relationships amongst other brothers and sisters, believers in Jesus, and then, then with the outside world. Relationships are everything. And so a kingdom vision for relationships is that you, having been raised with Christ, having put off your old nature, You take on this new nature of compassion and patience and kindness and generosity. That you, through that, become a person of love, displaying that to everyone you meet, every time you meet them, everywhere you go. Become a person of love and put that on display every time. Through this lens, every encounter that you have with another person is an opportunity to grow in love. And sometimes, let's be really honest, the people who it's hardest to love will be the best lesson. Because if it's easy to love them in your own strength, you're not really drawing on God. You're not having to draw so heavily on this new nature because you kind of wanted to do it anyway. And you would have done if you didn't know Jesus. Sometimes the people that cause you the most grief are the people that have got the most to teach you about what it is to love in the kingdom. 
really practically after a year like this, now is the time to invest in relationships here at St. Phillips. In connect groups, in teams that you're part of, in other ways, individual friendships and networks and all that stuff. After a year when that's been really hard, we've had to find new ways to relate. When people coming in haven't had the chance even to, to sit around a table and have a drink with someone who's part of the church. Now that that's becoming more and more possible, now is the time to invest in the relationships because the strength of St. Philip's is in its relationships. The strength of the vision that we've got will only come to be if these relationships are strong. So invite someone over. Find someone who's new. Introduce yourself. Do something which is going to take it beyond just small talk. Invest in those relationships any way you know how. Because the strength of this place is in its relationships. Look out for someone that you've not met. Pray for a different person each day and let them know that you've done it. Make a beeline for the difficult person. That's always a difficult thing to say because I'm hoping everyone doesn't flock to me at the end of the tour. (laughs) Now is the time to invest in the relationships. I'm very thankful for an online congregation that can't. Now is the time to invest in these relationships. Because the strength of this place, the the size of its vision means nothing if we don't relate to each other well. If there's grievances, disagreements, sort them out. I'm not saying that's easy. I'm not saying that won't take other people's help. I'm not saying that will not take a ton of grace. But we've got a God who's got that in abundance, right? So in conclusion, imagine what would happen as a whole group of us go about relating to each other in this way. Not just ones and twos, but tens and dozens and many times over. I think a church would form of all sorts of people from all sorts of backgrounds, old and young, and male and female, and Mancunian and in from elsewhere, of every kind of profession. I think a church would form that really represents what the kingdom is about. United in Christ, holy through his free gift, treating each other as he has treated us. Jesus said, ultimately, that the world will know that you're my disciples by the way that you love one another. That's the kingdom vision for relationships in a sentence. Love each other as I have loved you. And do that every time, everywhere, to every person. And the kingdom will come as you do it. A group of people going about relating to each other in that way would truly be irresistible. People wouldn't be able to keep themselves away because it would be an encapsulation, a little foretaste of something otherworldly. And how about it? The kingdom is of another world. So in your relationships this week, seek to bring God's kingdom as it is in heaven, here on earth, through your relationships, in your families, your friendship groups, your work situations. Be an agent of the kingdom of heaven. And watch what happens as you relate to people, as Christ has related to you. Let the kingdom come through the way that you choose to live. 